But we've been doing a series here at the church entitled Undeserved. And uh, it simply is this, Undeserved, we're looking at the free gift of mercy. And mercy only comes from God. There, you, you know this by now. People are pretty unmerciful usually. Unless they come into contact with God, they, they don't have a lot of mercy on each other. In fact, the world that we live in can exalt someone to the highest level. But man, if they do something wrong, they will be, they have no mercy on that individual. And all of a sudden, you'll see them fall from this great place down because they have no mercy. But God is merciful. And so in week number one, we looked at this. We said that God's specialty is mercy. You know, everybody in the world that lives out in the world, you would probably say about them, there's something that they specialize in. Some people specialize in like the job that they work or uh, they're a teacher and they specialize in a certain area where they teach in. All great. But God's specialty is mercy. And I don't know if you understand this or not. If God specializes in mercy, that means that's the thing that is really important to him. He is always wanting to reach mercy out towards people. And then in week number two, we talked about this just last weekend. We said that God is full of mercy. We've all done this before and probably not always in a great way, but we've all said this before. So-and-so is full of, right? We've all, we've all done it before at one time or another in our life. Some of you are looking at me like, I've never talked like that. Yeah. Um, we believe you never have. But anyway, we've all said it before. Well, God's word says this, that he is full of of mercy. God's not a quarter full. God's not half full. God's full of mercy. And I think sometimes we think, well, will it run out? No, he's full. God is perpetually full of mercy. He never runs out of mercy. But here's the deal. We always think, well, that's good. That's good for someone. But God's merciful to you. And today we're going we're gonna to continue on in this series, and I want to talk to you a little bit more about it. But before we do, this word undeserved and the title of our message, if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down if you haven't yet. Undeserved really means this, not earned. So you can't earn mercy, right? It's not deserved. It's not justified. It's not merited. In other words, when you think about mercy, anything about mercy you can think of, you don't really deserve it, but you get it. Sort of the same way with grace, right? Grace is something that God has done. It's free. It's yours. But you didn't deserve it. He just gives it to you. So a lot of times we confuse grace with mercy. So just one more time, I want to talk to you about this. Grace is God's unmerited favor. So when you think about grace, it's God's ability towards mankind. And when you think about grace, grace empowers us to live like Jesus. That's why we call it unmerited favor. We can't earn it. We don't deserve it. It's free. Mercy is a little bit different. Mercy is deliverance for ju from judgment. How many here have ever done something and you know, really honestly, if God wanted to, God could just come down and put his finger on you and kill you because you just did something really bad. But that's what this is. Mercy is deliverance from that. Mercy is God not punishing you for what you deserve. And that's why we call it withheld punishment. Mercy is God withholding his punishment from, from all of us. So I, I want to start off with the scripture today. It's found in the New Testament, 2 Corinthians, and it'll be on the screen if you just want to read along. Chapter 1, verse 3 says this, Blessed be God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he's talking about God the Father. He says, the Father of mercies. Everyone say mercies. The Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. Here's what I want to start off and just talk to you just for a moment before we get into the, the, the meat of what I want to talk to you about. The Bible says that God is a God of mercies, plural. More than one. And if you're, you're here and you're like, well, what do you mean more than one mercy? Well, here's the deal. You need mercy differently than another person needs mercy. In other words, you've done something different than what they've done. So they need mercy in their situation. You need mercy in your situation. I don't know if you know this or not, but in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they came to Jesus and multiple, multiple times people came to Jesus and they said this, Lord, have mercy on us. We'll hear this statement, son of David, have mercy on us. All through the gospels. And when they came and asked that, some of them did not need the same thing. Like one person came to Jesus and they said, Lord, have mercy on us. And they needed healing. And they walked away with healing, but Jesus gave them mercy. Because what? Healing is part of mercy. If you're here today and you're like, man, I need something in my life, that's part of God's mercy. His mercy will just reach out to you and give you whatever it is 
that you need. So when, I, when, when we talk about this, you know, when I, when I was studying this out, the one thing that I thought about was this, that over the last seven to 10 years in the church realm, here's what we've seen. People have almost painted God as the bad guy and Jesus as the good guy. Like, yeah, you read that Old Testament. God was crazy. He's, he's like the crazy one. Thank God he sent Jesus. He, he's pretty normal. Now, I want you to know something. God is the God of mercy. So God is the one that mercy originates from. Thank God for Jesus. And Jesus came, he died, resurrected. He's part of God. We all know that. But God the Father is a God of mercies. And wherever you need mercy at in your life today, God has mercy for you today. So there's one, one concept today that I want to look at. And as I was studying this out, if you go through your Bible and just look for this, you would find it. Mercy is always paired with something else. Like when you read your Bible, it will, we'll, we'll see Paul always say grace and mercy. He starts off almost every book that he wrote and ends every book that he wrote with grace and mercy. It's an interesting. So he's always talking about grace and mercy. He, they're companions. He ties them together. But in scripture, you'll find that uh, mercy is also paired with other things. So you'll see mercy and faithfulness, right? You'll see mercy and something else. Well, I want to specifically talk to you just about one of them today. So instead of going through every single one, you can go ahead and do a study on that if you'd like. I want to look at one, and I want to read a scripture from Psalm 23. And we're going to go to verse 6. So just one scripture. Listen to what this says. Surely, everyone say surely. Goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So the thing that I want to talk to you about today is goodness and mercy. So if you're taking notes, you can write this down. I entitled my message today, real simple, The Chase. You'll see what we're going to talk about concerning that in a moment. But I want to talk about goodness and mercy and this concept that the writer of the book of Psalms, David, says, follows you. But I love that he starts it off like this. He says, surely, goodness and mercy. You know what surely means? Surely literally means undoubtedly or for sure or no doubt. Uh, we would say it today like no duh. Surely, goodness and mercy, right? They'll follow you all the days of your life. And I love this. All the days of your life means from your young all the way until you're old. Never will it stop following you. So I want to just take this concept and, and give you a couple illustrations today that I think will help you to understand. And we'll have a little bit of fun with this. So it says that in the King James Bible, New King James, it reads it this way. Surely goodness and mercy will follow you. So I want to just take the word follow or shall follow. And I want to give you an example of this. So I asked you guys, two of my friends, to come out here. I believe uh, Josh is going to be coming out. Josh was up here leading worship. And then our drummer, Joseph, is going to come out. And this is, this is going to be just an example of meet, meet goodness and mercy. This is goodness and mercy, all right? So listen to what it says. The Bible says, goodness and mercy shall follow you. So wherever you go, goodness and mercy are following you. So no, no matter where, listen, this is the crazy thing. This is really crazy. If you're here today at church and last night you walked into a bar, goodness and mercy don't check out at the door. They just come right in with you. Why? Because they're following you all the time. See, we have a picture of God that if we do something wrong, this stops. But God's not like that. God is always in pursuit of you. So goodness and mercy, no matter what you've done, and maybe you're here and you say, well, I didn't go into a bar, but I did this. It doesn't matter whatever you did. You went and locked yourself in your bedroom and did something you shouldn't do last night. Guess what happened? Goodness and mercy, they were in there with you. Wherever you go, whatever you do, goodness and mercy are following you. Are you with me? So you get that picture, you, you start to understand it. But I, I want to just show you a definition just real quickly while goodness and mercy hang out with me up here. Um, the word shall follow, because you know, we're, we're, we're talking about just the word follow. They're following me. But the word follow or shall follow means this, to run after. 
Usually in the Hebrew language with hostile intent, God's not being hostile. What he's saying is the kind of pursuit. This is the kind of pursuit God has to run down, to jump on. And in fact, further in the Hebrew, it's defined as to chase. It's where we got our title of our message this weekend, to chase, follow hard after, to hunt, and to pursue closely. Can I, can I, can I give you this illustration real quick, and then we're going to open this up a little more. Um, hunting back then is different than hunting today. I know you might say, no, 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 it's not. No, no, like when you can go on a trip and go to a preserve somewhere and they have the animals there and you just shoot at them. Wow, hunting. Now, if you've done that before, don't get mad at me, but that's not real hunting. Like for instance, you know, if you're just sitting in a tree from four o'clock in the morning until a deer walks by, it's really, it's hunting in a, in a way. I'm up here real quiet. I'm just gonna, I got a feeder down there. I know they're gonna come eventually. They're gonna eat and then I'm gonna shoot them. That's really not the kind of hunting this is painting. Here's my question. Why does God want to chase us down, hunt us down? I want to give you this illustration real quick before we open this up a little more. Here's what's interesting. In the book of Genesis, God created Adam and Eve, right? You all know the story. God created Adam and Eve. If you believe the Bible, that story is a true story. He created Adam and Eve, and they sinned by chapter 3. So chapter 1, God creates all this stuff creates man. Man, so awesome. Chapter three, sin. And when they sin, you know what they did? They ran from God and hid. You know what God did? He was chasing them down. All the way back in the book of Genesis, God already had this concept that I will always hunt down, chase down mankind. I am never going to just have mankind get away from me, although we try to get away, right? Now, check this out. So the word shall follow, means literally to chase, run after, hunt down, right? So I'm going to bring another person out, because this would have been me, and Tino is going to be the good sport, and Tino's going to do the running. I didn't want to run with, you know, shoes on like this. So Tino, these goodness and mercy are going to start chasing Tino, right? So Tino's going to take off a little bit here, just sort of mildly, not real fast yet. So, Tino, this is just some guy trying to serve the Lord, but goodness and mercy are going to chase him down, right? But, but just hold on, just for a second, Tino. What if Tino really screws up, and what he wants to do is run from God? Has anyone ever done something that you just want to run from God? Well, here's what I found out. Most of us run from God when we do something wrong. So Tino's running from He's running from God because he did something wrong. But goodness and mercy aren't going to let him just get away. They're going to just keep on chasing him. Right? But hey, hey, it doesn't end here. Hey, the Bible says that while Tino's running, goodness and mercy are going to jump on him. Come on. Goodness and mercy are going to jump on him and let's give them a hand. Great job. So goodness and mercy are hunting us down. Now think about, I want you to think about it just for a moment. Why would goodness be part of this? Why is goodness and why didn't God say something else and mercy will hunt you down? Because we think that when we do something wrong, God's not happy with us and he's sort of mad and he's sort of angry and he probably doesn't have anything good right then for us, right? Right? because we did something bad. But here's what God, God wants this picture painted in your mind. Goodness and mercy, they're going to follow you, hunt you down, run you down, chase you down, even when you've done wrong. And the reason why goodness is put in there is because God is good. He's not bad. He wants to do good for you. He doesn't want to do bad. Are you with me? So I want you to, I want you to hear this. Um, In Romans chapter 8, a scripture that I I think many of us have heard this before, but in Romans chapter 8, most of us are familiar with it. We've been in church. It says this, verse 28, we know that all things work together for good. Everyone say good. To those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. And so I started studying that out because it, it, it always bothers me when people sort of make this kind of statement about God. They'll say, you know, even though this is all really bad, everything bad that is happening to me, I know God's doing this. 
And that's not what the scripture is saying. In fact, as you study it out of their original language, it, 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 it paints a different picture completely than what religion has said about it. So listen to what, this is a translation that comes more from exactly the way it's stated in the Greek language. Watch this. It says, moreover, we know that to those who love God, who are called according to his plan, everything that happens fits into a pattern for good. In other words, God's always trying to get a pattern of good in your life, not a pattern of bad. Not a pattern of doing something to you because you did something wrong. The reason why goodness and mercy are following you is because God wants a pattern of good in your life. So I want you to think about this. When you think about mercy and you think about goodness, what are some of the things God's, what's, what's he trying to chase you down with? Well, we just saw that he's chasing us down with mercy. We saw that he's chasing us down with goodness, right? But how about these? God's chasing us down with mercy, forgiveness, kindness, grace. We could just go on and on and on of what he's chasing you down with. Our problem is we run, and our problem is we don't really want anything to do with God when we've screwed up or we've messed up. I think this is interesting. Mark chapter 10 and verse 18, um, Jesus is on the planet, right, talking to people, and they start saying this about Jesus. They start saying, he's just so good. No one, no one is good as him. He's a good, he's a good man. Listen to this. And Jesus said to them, Mark 10, 18, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. He's saying no one is like God. God is the only one that is good. He is the good one. Everyone else is pretty much bad is what he's saying, but God is good. Our mentality and religion has skewed it to be this. God isn't good. There's times that God will be okay to you, but he's really not good. There are times he's going to do something bad to you. And then we start blaming all bad on God. I want you to hear this. God is not the author of bad. God is the author of good. God is not authoring bad in your life. There might be bad going on, but here's what I want you to know. We are not good most of the time, but he is always good all the time. He is a God that is full of goodness, and he wants his goodness in your life for a reason. Now, think about this. As Christ followers, if you're hearing today that you are a Christ follower, Scripture says that what he wants from us is he wants us to show mercy to others. He said, just as the Father shows mercy, I want you now to be merciful. So he wants us to be the same way. And I think it's interesting when you, when you think about Scripture, I think there's a group of people sitting here today that you've never experienced God's goodness and you've never experienced God's mercy. So I want, I want to read this real quick to you. Listen to this. Psalm 34, 8 says this. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. So it's something you're supposed to experience. Is he says you're supposed to taste it. In the, in the New Testament, 1 Peter 2, 3, for those that are like, oh, I don't know if that's even a scriptural thing in the New Testament, says if you indeed have tasted that the Lord is good. Some of you have a bad taste in your mouth. Some of you have felt like, you know what, I, I've not tasted that the Lord is good. This marriage that I'm in, it's made me feel like, why God, why God, why are you doing this to me? Um, this family situation that I'm in, I, I go to God all the time and I'm asking God, why God, why, why are you doing this? Can I say to you, as much as we want to always put the blame on him, he's good. And if it'd be better for you to go to God and say, God, I'm in a marriage that's troubled. And oh yeah, by the way, I'm the one causing most of it. Right? We don't do that. We want to go to God and just say, why'd you give me this woman? Why'd you give me this man? Right? We want to go to God and talk to him like that. And the truth of the matter is he's good. He has good plan for your life. He has good plan for your relationship with your kids. He has good plan for the relationship in your marriage. He's a good God, not a mean, bad God. And so today, I started thinking about the end of this worship experience, which we're not done yet, so stick with us. But we sing this song in our church, and it's about reckless love. And when you think about, uh, when you think about this whole idea of mercy and goodness, involved in the word mercy is compassion. Involved in the word mercy is pity. Involved in the word mercy is love. So all these words are encompassed in that word mercy. And so today I thought, I th 
before we did anything else in the worship experience and go any further, I thought, what if we just took a moment to let this sink in? And there's probably no better way, I think, to have some things sink into us sometimes when we get it from a song. It's just some, something happens. You're like, oh man, I get that now. And so I want to just, I want to just take a moment. We're not done. I don't want you to sneak out. I know you can get out and get out of here quicker than other people if you do it right now. But I feel like there's a moment here God wants us to have. Sometimes we run out of church so fast, we miss the moment. So let's not miss the moment that God wants in our lives right now. So I asked our team to come back up and I want to just sing this song just for a little bit. Then I'm, I'm going to come back up and share something with you. So let's, let's go ahead and stand and we'll sing this. Thank you, Lord. I so love the part where he says he'll chase us down. That love's going to climb a mountain. It's going to jump over a wall. Whatever it has to do, it's going to get to you no matter what. So thankful for that. Today, before we, before we do anything else, can we just do this for a moment? Maybe you're watching us online. Maybe watching from one of our prison campuses. But wherever you're watching from or you're here, can we just close our eyes just for one moment? This is just a, a private moment between you and God. And maybe you're here and this message today has struck you, has struck a chord in your heart. And you realize today, I've been running from God. And here's the thing, we, if we're running from God, somewhere, somehow, some point in our life, we have to just surrender to him. I like it when they jumped on him and just carried him off. It was like just a picture of that's what God wants to do. He wants to run you down, jump on you, and then he wants to just be the one that picks you up and carries you. And if you're here today and you're like, man, I need, I need God today. I need Jesus today. I need this in my life today. His eyes are closed just for one moment. The good news is that Jesus died for us because none of us could save ourselves. Your good works, your good things that you would try to do will never amount to enough to get you in a relationship with God. But Jesus died for you so that you could come into a relationship with a God that is perfect, knowing that you're imperfect, and he's okay with it. We have a passion at Faith Family Church to discover all that God has for us. We welcome and honor our guests so you can experience a church that is full of life and encounter a God that's real and loves you. Our worship experiences are designed for every age, helping you to live out a personal relationship with Jesus and develop an authentic faith in him. We want to redefine church as you might know it, and we're reaching people around the world through our live stream. So we encourage you to join us live online every Sunday at 10 a.m. and Wednesdays at 7 p.m. Because Faith Family Church is for families, for singles, for couples, for the elderly, for young people, for the hurting, the lost, the hopeless. Faith Family Church is for people.